to my Sunday live stream. And today we have a special guest, uh, David Crooks. He's a very good friend of mine and also runs the local photography club that I uh, also am a member of. And we go out every week and do things. And he's also been a photographer for a very long time. He's uh, uh, won awards for some of his photography and um, is an accomplished photographer in his own right. But he's also a uh, uh, very technical person. He's a, um, what do you call it, programmer or uh, code monkey. I don't know what, what they call these guys. But, you know, he's he is a very adept at uh, computer stuff. And uh, hence, you know, whenever a new software comes out that will help improve his images or work with his images, uh, he always checks them out. And he's going to talk about two today that, at least one I know is uh, pretty well known or established. They've, they've built a name for themselves. The uh, Topaz uh, Photo AI. And uh, another one I've never heard of until he, he mentioned it, and that's Radiance. And uh, I'll let him talk about the software you know, more in depth. And, and he's going to do a little demonstration with some images to show what they can do and how they can help you get you know more out of your images. Uh, but for me, you know, I've used uh, Topaz... And I do have the Topaz uh, Sharpen, Topaz Denoise, and the Topaz Gigapixel. And they're all fine products in their own right. Uh, and also, um, and then I use uh, DxO Photo Labs and things. But he tries everything, you know, Luminar, Radiant, uh, all the different kinds. You know, I'm more of a, like, once I find something I like and it does what I want, I just kind of stick with it and I don't, I don't go out too far from there. Uh, so that's why I wanted to bring David in because he, he uses this software and specifically Topaz introduced this photo AI, <clears throat> which, uh, I guess is more of a raw preprocessor like DxO pure raw, but it has even more capabilities beyond just reducing noise. And, um, they've combined, I guess their package of Sharpen, Denoise, and Gigapixel all into one and call it Photo AI and may have added some more features. Like I said, I'll let Dave talk about it because I'm not I'm not uh, that familiar with the product itself. I haven't, you know, there's no free trials that I could get to. Uh, and he's also going to talk about uh, another photo editor out there called Radian, and that's also new to me. Uh, so I thought it'd be a good opportunity uh, for David to demonstrate what it does because Again, it's um, there's so many things out there that that I think are worth trying um, and looking into if you haven't committed to anything yet. Because you know, the the Achilles heel of things like Lightroom and things is the you know once you're into that system, it's hard to get out, right? Uh, so I think this would be a good opportunity for you guys to check out something if you're not committed to a specific software yet, and that's what Dave will do for us. So. Uh, and then uh, we'll do, I guess that'll run about maybe a half an hour tops, I would imagine. But uh, after the demonstration or demo, he can uh, answer questions about it, uh, maybe try a few things if you guys wanted to see something spe more specific. Uh, but without further ado, uh, let me bring David in. And let's see. I need to switch screens one second. Hey, Dave, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, good. How are you, Rob? Good, good. So um, this is David Crooks, everyone. And um, why don't you tell us what you have for us today? Yeah, so uh, yeah, there have been a couple last week or two. There have been a couple new software that just came out, released. And Topaz came with the Photo AI. And then Radiant came out with their new product. It's part of Perfectly Clear, if you've heard of that product. They, the the developers who are photographers bought the engine for that and added AI technology to that tool and made it into a, a photo editor. So it does kind of compete with the Luminar and other editing products, Lightroom. So I'll go through. I, I selected four photographs to go through. And I did want to you know, thank Rob for he he's been kind of backing me up as I as I. Kind of broke my wrist <laughs> had a fight with a tree and i lost <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it was that kind of put me down for like a month and 
might take my brace off a little easier to type with and it was also Rob's birthday a few days ago so we wish i sure wish him a happy birthday so. oh thanks dave <laughs> you didn't have to mention that but i appreciate it so all right let's get started i, I picked i said four photos okay uh and let me know when you want to share the screen yeah go ahead okay so this is the photo ai you can use it as you know both the product products you can use as standalone or as plugins to both Lightroom and Photoshop. So I'm going to use them as standalone, just you know, so you can see the way it works like that. But again, you can use it as plugins, which is probably what I would do personally. Is I, use, I still use Lightroom for category for my catalogs, and then I'd use it as a plugin, bounced between the products. So I selected these four photos. I'm just going to drag them over. So this is a butterfly shot that's 12,800 ISO. So you see it's pretty grainy. <laughs> and it's automatically scanning the image on the bottom left has a status bar. And I can move it up to the head of the butterfly. And it's got this autopilot going on. It's, so it's, it says that it's raw image data. It selected a subject. So it already masked that auto, automatically. And it says that it's removing the strong noise, raw noise. And then going down to the image quality, you can see the removed raw noise. And, and so you, you can override whatever you know, think is going to clean it up is enough. You can override the strength with the slider and it, it'll go from there but it so that's the denoise product so topaz took their three products denoise and sharpen ai and, and gigapixels and put it into one product and so that's all it is it is like a preprocessor, like rob said so it's not going to do any other image enhancement Besides just removing the noise, sharpening, and enhancing the for the resolution, as you see in the bottom here. So one thing I did think is kind of curious is it'll kind of fix the uh, the raw noise, which might be kind of hard to see. I know in YouTube kind of says, uh, changes the noise level, but you can see the noise is getting cleaned up pretty well. But I know sometimes it doesn't really select the sharp and all these always. So, and I think it's, you know, it does a pretty good job of sharpening. Again, it's just going to mask for the butterfly itself. It's not going to try to sharpen the background, which you generally don't want to do. And again, you have a slider for the strength. And you can go between the lens blur and a motion blur. So you can test those out and see. You know what you get better better outcome for the results so it does do some face detection and again the, for the enhanced resolution any questions or no if you could when when it does if, the subject select uh mm -hmm. What is that for exactly? Is it because it looks like it's still denoising things outside of the subject? Yeah, well, it's it denoises. I guess I'm not sure how to explain that. Then, yeah, I mean, I do see you know there's always this noise, and then it's going to go through. So it does denoise the whole image, but then it's more selective on what's getting. Maybe what's sharpened. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is more than sharpened, but it does on the raw image too. Okay. Yeah, with tool tips. So. so this this was a twelve thousand eight hundred. Yep. Let's um can you um take off that uh, layer and see how it looks? Yeah, I mean There we go. 
Okay. And I can, there, they do have three different, I mean, you can obviously zoom all the way up to 800%. You can do full screen and then co comparison. Right, right. And I'll wait a little bit for it to render. Okay, so we're, I, I, I kind of missed the part. Did you just drag these images from like a file folder? To yes. Edit these? Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is running as standalone, but again, it does work. You know, obviously, the same way as a plugin from Lightroom so, or Photoshop. Or <clears throat> okay. Um, and at this point, how would you? Um, I see it just says save image, so it saves the image. Let's see what that does. What options yep. we have? Yeah, so it does give it a name based on your filters, and you can change that. So I did a topaz denoise and sharpen, and it's going to save it as a TIFF. Okay, what and, what other export options do we have? We have TIFF. Yeah, so you can preserve okay. the import uh, JPEG, PNG, and TIFF, and DNG. Okay. I generally do all my stuff in TIFFs. Yeah. Um, can, I usually do the compression as a zip and a 16-bit. Right, right. I found um, if for DXO, uh, mm -hmm. I have to do uncompressed TIFF. Really? If I'm going to go into and use Photolab for my photo editing. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So I guess at this point you would export it. How's the performance overall? I guess, I mean, it's always going to be dependent on which your computer, right? Sure, definitely. But um, it, it's pretty quick. Okay. And right, save and yeah, it's going to, it chugs along. Yeah, that's pretty quick. And I mean, it's going from a 23.4 megapixels to 116. <laughs> Right, so, right. Because yeah, I, I think our Olympus cameras are twelve bit yeah. RAWs, so it's right. it's expanding it to a sixteen bit, right. you know, kind of upscaling it. Sure, a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um let, let's see a couple That's other good. you said you had a couple other images, right? Yep. Yeah, you want me to pick another let's see. And I can close this image. Um, let me see, one's Nespray. So these goldfinches are ISO 6400. There we go. And we move that up. There we go. So again, it selected the subject, which is just doing the the flower, right? The some flower. Okay. You're really selecting the. And I think you can refine it from there too. With the sliders, you know, select portrait right. landscape options right. there. So it's kind of. I don't know if this is. I mean, to be able to, if I really want to select these birds, it's not going to. You probably have to just play the sliders. It's not like you can drag the mask around. Right, or, or use a brush or anything. Correct. All right, that's what I'm saying. And again, I didn't touch the sharpening, which this does need a little bit of sharpening. Okay. Let's so select that. And so... Sorry, I'm so crutched it. over because I, I have to get close to the screen to see it. Yeah, it's... Let me go back to the slider. Here we go. Is that better? No, yeah, it was fine before. I was just... Okay. Um, yeah, I was doing the comparison, so it's... Okay, so it, it doesn't look like it's over-sharpening, which, which I hear some people complain about DxO sometimes. They feel mm. like they're over-sharpened. Yeah, you do have to kind of watch, obviously, just in general. And if you do the radiant, it also does sharpening. So, again... Don't want to double sharpen, right? So, now, did you say that uh, the software automatically select makes recommendations what to do, what it can do for the image, or yeah, that's in the autopilot. It just it's, right now okay. it's just saying to remove the moderate raw noise is all it's suggesting. 
Okay. I have had images. One image, which I couldn't find after I did it, but it's like um, I actually did did expand it like by right, three times in the upscale. Right. Just to get a better quality of it. Right. So you, about, you can play with that as well. Turn off that subject only tick box under the sharpen. Right here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now it sharpened the bird a little bit. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. I see. So um, bring that, that bird on the right to the center, and let's just do a before and after. Yeah, you can see on the eye up here. Right. Oh, that looks much better. It's definitely more sharper. Yeah, that okay. makes sense. And then and then push the strength to 100%. I'm ju I just want to see how extreme it is. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, it, it's pretty quick. That's That doesn't look too bad, actually. Yeah. I mean, it's compared to what it was. Right, right. It actually looks a lot better at 100%. Yeah, it, it doesn't. I have seen where you know, it gets really crunchy, you know, fine lines. Yeah, really yeah. I think if we were doing a very high ISO image, you know, sixty four hundred is not. Ter I mean, it's not ideal, but it's not the worst, right? Right. Exactly. That's why the twelve. That's what we're going to show the twelve thousand. Yeah, I've noticed. You know, when you get up to twenty five thousand or something. Right. I should have found one like that. Um, yeah. You okay. know, you're just sharpening noise, basically. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's my thing. You know, some there's I've always been told that you always denoise first because you and my thought is, you know, why would you want to enhance a photograph that's all real noisy and it's really hard to you know see the details. Yeah. So you want to get rid of the noise first, then you can really you're supposed to sharpen last, is what I've heard also. And so you know, that's just how you you define your workflow, and that's what I used to do with with the regular DXO, not the DXO, the Topaz denoise and sharpen. I would denoise it, then go into Luminar, and then go into Sharpen at the end. Okay. So, um, so let's let's look at your workflow then. I guess when you go from the butterfly or this image to uh, rating, because now this the the Topaz Photo AI is pretty much done, right? Correct. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. It's, so I'll save this one again. It just I'll have the same settings, and you can just send the help it, help the autopilot to Topaz. But that's about it for just saving it. And again, it goes pretty quickly for saving. Yeah, but I mean, you got a kick-ass machine too. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to Marco. <laughs> yeah, you're using like a real desktop computer versus you know, I'm I'm the laptop, laptop life, you know. Laptop, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I got a big GeForce GTX graphics card. Thanks to Marco. Okay. Yeah, Mark Marco is one of our viewers here. I think I saw him in the chat earlier. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, he has his own channel called uh, Hot Hardware. So yeah, check him out. He's a great resource because he's also an Olympus. Uh, OM Systems photographer. Yep. He can he can help set you up with the right gear yep. or desktop or laptop. You so want to see, him, see it in Radiant now? Yeah. Yeah, let's see where you take sort of that processed image into Radiant. Now, Radiant's just a uh, photo editor, right? Correct. Like I said, it does do some sharpening. So it's got the... I'm going to drag my photo here, although... I did find a bug. I mean, these are both, you know, 1.0. I think Topaz uh, Photo AI just came out with photo uh, version 1.01 <laughs> just like yesterday or sometime recently. So these are both, both 1.0 versions. And I did find that I can't, I'm not able to drag into Radiant. And so I, their customer service is pretty good, but they wanted me to do like a video show them. It's like I don't have time to give you a video right now. Yeah. So, yeah. so I have to select here and then I can select the photo. 
I can pick my butterfly shot here to open it. Again, I'd probably use it as a plug-in in Lightroom or whatever, or Photoshop. And so here's, you know, they both have the slider and things before and after. Okay. And so this, I did not, you know, I just opened it up in Radiant. And this is what it gave me. Oh, all it's, right. So it just automatically applied something. Yeah. So like it does these preset. presets and it does auto detect with the AI stuff that, that it's flower and plants. I guess I don't have insects and you can oh, also have other presets as well. <clears throat> so this is a, this is like a, almost a, an AI type photo. Yeah. Correct. Wow. Yep. Okay. And again, you've got the sliders on the right hand side. If you don't, if it's, you know, the strength is too much, the color is too much. If you have right. people in it, you can do skin toning. It does have a histogram. Mm -hmm. So you can check out your histogram. You can do cropping so I can crop this a little bit. So it's got your, has your, and the cropping, I thought this was interesting for you, Rob. It's got your golden ratio. So you can. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I hate that thing. I know. So I thought, oh, good. Rob's got his golden ratio. In here. <laughs> golden ratio. That thing, it it's basically covers the entire image. I mean, you can there you go. You can fit everything into a golden ratio. It doesn't matter what you shoot. <laughs> so there, there's your golden ratio. So how it fits in with okay. my image. But of course, you can do your uh, thirds, and they have the two two ways of doing the gold. Um, for the rule of thirds and then you can do a grid right do it yeah I use, I use the grid a lot yeah um okay that's something i haven't that photo lab is kind of lacking but in i use i use the grid a lot in lightroom for my arch architectural real estate stuff and so once i start the cropping i can move it you know the, the box around right you like that okay i'm gonna move it around and then you can apply the crop so if you want a little more centered right i'm going to turn off the histogram because i'm not really okay, you can so do, do the regular so flip if you want to do things like uh you know bring bring the blacks down or mm -hmm. pull, pull in some highlights and and yep. you know just some basic type editing yeah it has your toning exposure has a super contrast okay um one one i guess one on the ui part of it this i mean you got this whole big screen and probably our ways and the, <laughs> haven't played with it enough but i'm down to like this little box down here and i've got you know scroll down to see what all my options are mm -hmm. and here's the sharpening and it's applying sharpening on top of what i just did with with topaz so i can right. turn it off here or, or changing else it even has some noising as well so right again you're you know i would just just say you know that it, it, it is easy to overdo so you know, most of the processing is better to hit it with a light touch than you know too much throwing too many of these tools at it and it, i've seen artifact in in some of the in some of the topaz so yeah, I mean it's it. it's easy to over process an image. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Uh, <clears throat> got a graduated filter. God knows I'm guilty of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it does have the exposure slider. Okay. Yeah, it has a contrast slider. So it has you know a lot of things that you have in the Lightroom and you know, basic editors. Okay. So I mean the, the primary the primary, I guess, advantage of this software or its key selling point would be just the the, the auto presets that it has to right. analyze the image and uh, give you yeah. something ready to go. Right. Yeah, and those presets on the left, there's a whole bunch of them, and you can. Right, I think right now they have what they have like a subscription things like fifty dollars a year, and it includes a bunch of presets and lots and things like that that you can apply in here so that it has okay. all different i think one of the owners was big into cats i couldn't find any photos of cats 
but it has all these options for cats. So, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Right, right. So, okay. It's got, uh, it's got portrait options, and then it does have mm -hmm. color grading also. So I'll just touch those real quick. To show that. Yeah. Okay, so it's basically a full photo editor for color and yep, yep. Um, highlight shadows, lighting, has a histogram. Yep. Right. So it's not lacking really anything you would need. Basically, it's just layering on top some uh, some automated presets. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it does it automatically choose a preset when you drag an image in, or? Yeah. So it does detect auto. The AI detects what kind of based on I the see. left side here. You know whether it's a person or an animal or okay something like that, and it'll right try to. Right. Fix it based on that. And again, you can override it. That's one of the things you're not stuck with what it gives you. Okay. So I can save this one and show you the save screen. This one's a pretty extensive save screen. Mm -hmm. I think one of the other benefit with this product is it does do bulk bulk editing. So if, like if you're going on a job and you got you know 50 photographs of them on your on your job, you can just bring them in here and it'll handle bulk editing and you can you can see on the bottom you can sync them forward so if i had 50 images down here in this little film strip down here i only got the one image but it, it would you can sync the all the way across those settings right so right. you have to go through 50 individually it'll do it all bulk wise and then you can export them bulk okay as well now, now does radiant have like uh an import feature like if you Put your memory card in. You got maybe 500 images. Can you just import? No. Uh, okay, well, so. it's not really. It's right. It, you, it basically you have to have your own file management or data asset right. management software, yeah, or, or methodology if you don't use software. Right. Uh, and th and that's 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 what I was saying about earlier about the Achilles heel of Lightroom is kind of once you get into there. Right. Yeah. Uh, that, asset management. You're you're kind of stuck without too many options. I mean, there's there's other software out there that supposedly will import that database and yada yada. But yeah, uh, this is this is the only the only uh, thing about you know non Adobe products is a mm -hmm. lot of them don't have very good file import and file management type things. Um, yeah. <clears throat> at least the ones that I like, you know, that I've tried. Yeah, Dixo and, and the Luminar. Even Luminar has tried to do some category, category, categories, cataloging. That's what I'm trying to say. They are trying to do some of that. And they've enhanced it a little bit, but it's, you know, definitely not up to the same level as Lightroom still. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Lightroom has been, it, it's, you know, it's really the only reason I keep using it is because of the, the cataloging and and being able to find right. photos quickly and and yep. and things. Uh, but that's that's only it's not really necessary for the typical enthusiast that they're not trying right. to run their yeah you don't have to run their you know do their photography as a business. You know, it's not as critical. But as a business, you know, uh, it can be important to catalog your your images so that you have that resource for later you know if you want to sell an image later you can find it quickly right etc but this right. this is um so basically this will give you a good starting point yep or maybe even a, a finished product just by importing the image because it automatically detect mm -hmm. the, the kind of so. image it is and what it what would look good i guess yep uh and then you can kind of tweak it from there okay yep. and so, so as you're talking i went ahead and exported it and, and you see one pretty pretty quickly just to export that and yeah and so i can close the photo and does this have any kind of plug-in or anything for other products like lightroom or is yes it, uh, yeah yeah you okay. can yeah yeah definitely i think that's how i would you know use it in real life <laughs> yeah i would use it as you know use lightroom to import my stuff in the catalogs and you know you know if i think it needs to be quickly updated i can do that and bring it into radiant right do what right. it does so it's 
there's the image we worked on and again picked it as a flower and plant okay i'm sure why the drag here's the before and after i do like the dragging i think you can also yeah. click it and it does show you before and after so i kind of punched it up better right um, and you can zoom it up here it's kind of like i was trying to figure out you can just really zoom down to and drag it around and let that sit okay that was pretty okay. quick yeah pun punch fresh. in there to about 100 percent. let's just see a pixel to pixel there's 100. okay Okay, That's so it, it didn't do too much damage. It just basically punched up the contrast and uh, looks like it did a little work on the on the highlights. It's hard to tell because I'm looking at it, you right. know, through exactly. three different layers of processing before I even, exactly. would, you know, versus what you're seeing on your own screen. Yeah, this is kind of getting even on the edge of a little crunchy, but it's, I think, yeah. you know, seeing it as... Yeah, you can back it off. Back it off. You know, it doesn't, you know, this right. way you would really But, you know, the it. smart editing tab up there on the right has the strength. Right, so yeah. You, you can, can back it off there. You can back well. it off there. And, again, this there are um, sharpening, which it is applying. So I probably should, you know, I can even turn that off. <clears throat> right. again, I don't want to double. Okay. Well, let me let me open it up to the the chat here real quick and see if anybody had any specific questions about this that you might be able to answer, sure. Or um, wanted to try something. <laughs> and while while we're waiting, because there's about a thirty second delay between when somebody types something in the chat and I actually see it. Okay, yeah, no but problem. I did put um, Dave's affiliate links for the Topaz and the Radiant. Okay. Where you can go, and I, I know you can download Radiant as a free trial, but I didn't see Correct. one for Photo AI yet. But no. you, can, you can download the the uh, individual pieces of it, you know, Topaz Sharpen, Topaz Denoise, and Gigapixel. Right. And the performance from those, I would imagine, would be the same as Photo AI. Just Photo AI just combines them right and the like you were saying the uh the topaz products these are basically pre-processors for the raw image before you bring it into another product like radiant to do the editing correct and radiance just adds an additional layer of, of ai or smart processing to get the images closer to a final product because raw images are just raw you know they're generally very flat yep. there's not much sharpening or other things being applied to it now does radiant support like om1 images right now does it, does it support um, raw, raw images i know the luminar just added that in their latest update i haven't tried it in radiant yet right i should have sent you an om1 yeah <laughs> image sorry right. about that but definitely no m1 mark three i would imagine is already uh oh compatible. yeah that's, yeah, that, yeah that's what i'm using here these are all orfs okay my one three so yep okay i do have i have to dig to find because i have shot with your camera and so i do have some old one images oh yeah yeah um, i would like to go as people i want to do a, uh, a person i have one with people in it mm -hmm. so let me close yeah if you have a portrait let's do let's do uh Let's do one for for, for the, those that shoot people like street photography or portrait mm -hmm. work. Or heard somebody got in trouble on Facebook for saying he was shooting, going to shoot a a model. He said, oh, "I'm going to shoot Rebecca." It's like he got put in. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, Facebook he got tagged for uh, yeah something. Can you see my yeah. screen? There's a lot. Yeah, I can see everything. Cool. There's a lot of. Um, <laughs> overlap in 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 uh language <laughs> right between like weapons and photography yep okay so here's uh, so this Photoshop. is the raw image here yes okay so it's using the raw image to selected the subject 
So I kind of missed her face. Again, I'm not sure how to... No, it looks like it got everything. Yeah. Let me do portrait, see if that helps. I, yeah, that just picked the people. So that yeah, okay, the, I see. That's better. So it didn't select the, the truck. So recognize that the truck is not a person. So and then it's this and this one's only ISO four hundred, of course. You know, I'm just out in yeah, the sun, sunlight, so there's not much. But you can see it kind of cleaned up a little bit on the right. Even there, and it, again, it didn't do any sharpening. I guess okay. that's by design because I've never seen a select do both noise and sharpen. Even the sharpening would help this a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I, under, I guess you don't you don't want to see people's skin pores all the time, right? But I did notice, like in this this clasp down here on the camera, it the sharpening does help a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, that looks Again, good. Yeah. So yeah, I mean this takes about that long to you know go through and make sure you're before and after. You really see on the on her earring, it really wasn't as sharp and noisy. Right. And now right. it's nice and clear. And can you you can batch process in in this too? I would assume because the old ones did, right? The previous yeah. previous ones did. Yeah. So I'm going to save this. Again, we're going from 18 megapixels to 105. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't do it in bulk. I would just pick a few images. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Go up and get a cup of coffee. So that's done. Let me close. I have to close the image here. So that's the photo AI. I'm going to jump the radiant. And I can pick up that image. And open that. I did enter this photo in a photo contest with local camera club. And I got honorable mention. Cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool photo. Yeah. And I did it in black and white, so we're going to make this one black and white. So, again, I recognize it as people, and there's people in the scene. Mm -hmm. And um, I did want to crop it a little bit. Let me start cropping because I want to kind of get rid of the background a little bit, tighten it up a little bit. That looks a little better. And then, uh, what other? I'm going to turn off that sharpening. You can save C, uh, excuse me, you can save presets. So if you have, you know, if I'm always doing, doing the same settings over and over again, you can save that as your own personal state preset. Right. And you can just select that over, probably on this left side. Yeah. That's something I haven't chance to do. But so that under the essentials, you can do balance, boost color. And the last one's classic BMW, black and white. So there's the image of black and white. And so that's what pretty much the image I entered in the photo contest. Okay. I was just thinking about, usually I like to have like a, um, a dark in the, uh, have a vignette. I haven't really seen where a vignette is in, maybe it's here. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So yeah, and you can place the center. That's nice. Luminar right. had that too. You can change the center of the if you think the center should be over here or whatever. Right, right. 
can can flip it inside outside so yeah i mean it's got quite a bit of tools i just wish this you know, real estate was larger so i could see more of the options at the same time it's just it scrolls and scrolls <laughs> yeah yeah and it does the face selection let's see it didn't detect these faces but you right there's not much to see yeah. that was the only criticism i got was you couldn't see the whole face or right or more, or see more of the face i guess like hindsight shoot it from the other angle where i can get more of her face at least yeah mm -hmm. so anyway that's okay that's all it. right dave um We'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Okay. And um, cool. thanks, thanks for taking time out to show us these products. I, yeah. Um, if there's any questions? I, let me know. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't see any come up in the in the chat other than you know, uh, a lot a lot of us are very minimalist when we come to editing. So sure. Yeah. No, that's, I understand yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Which which um, you know I think is. Uh, is fair i mean if you want sure. to be more creative and do things there's certainly the tools there to you know make the colors pop or um you know soften things up so that you can you can get more of a creative type look which are uh you know it's it's all about just having fun sometimes when you're doing editing right and 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 other times you know you just you just need a little help right yep. and being able to just drag and drop an image in and just get, cause it didn't, it didn't like do anything crazy, right? It just brought sure. it in, yep. gave it a little more contrast and just a slight increase on the color saturation. It looked like, yep. Yep. Uh, but it did it automatically for what it thought was the appropriate kind of preset. Uh, and the same thing with Topaz, it looks like it was a little bit conservative in, mm -hmm. you know, uh, at least on the sharpening side, which is it's always a problem that I see a lot. A lot of people, including myself, you know, we tend to over sharpen our images. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to see Topaz doesn't automatically just over sharpen. Exactly. Um, yeah. Photo AI. So, again, the, the links are down below for if you want to download the, the free trial for Radiant, which, you know, it's worth a try. If, if you're not happy with your current editor or you don't have an editor yet, you can try it and see how it works with your images. Yep. Yeah, they got videos uh, and lots of training to do. So, yeah. Yeah, there's, looks like there's good support. And this this is a brand new software, it looks like, right? Radio. Yeah, so like I said, they took the perfectly clear engine and they repackage it with the AI stuff to get, you know, oh, it's an older, okay. older product that a lot of people used. Some people used, I think I even have a copy of it somewhere. Yeah. I never even heard it perfectly clear until somebody brought it up last week. I was like, right. I never yeah. heard of it. Um, Cause yeah. my whole life is, you know, I started out uh, based on recommendations from another friend of mine. He says, yeah, just, just get Adobe Lightroom. I said, okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Sure. Um, and then once you're locked into that, you know, you, you can get out of it, right? There's cutting the cord as, as another YouTuber yeah, used to say, yep. but, um, yeah, but yeah, there's lots of options out there now. Sure. That are certainly, uh, you know, we're taking a look at, so, I all right. So. Um, all right. We will, uh, see you again soon david like i said i, I uh Good. if you guys are in the area here in the washington dc area you know check out the uh, meetup group it's the virginia beltway yeah virginia beltway photographers club i'll i'll try and put a link down to it later uh in the comments section i forgot to do that today i can do that uh, okay yeah if you can just leave it in the comment uh a okay. link to the group i i tend to go to almost every meet when i can um you know, so I'm out there every week with David. We're out shooting different places and, and time to time I'll do a class. So think about, uh, you know, if you're not local to us, think about joining another another photography group. It's one of the best things that I think you can do for your uh, photography, because otherwise I'd never get out of the house <laughs> <laughs> to shoot if it wasn't for a photo club and and making a commitment. OK, Dave, okay. we'll uh, see you. you again soon. Thanks for yep, coming in you. today. Thanks. All right. Bye bye. bye.
Okay, let me see if I can catch up on the chat section here. I tried to keep up a little bit while, while uh, Dave was showing the demo, but um, Alpha Male saying also try Capture One. So yeah, there, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of people that really like Capture One as well. And um, I use I use DxO products myself. Uh, the Photolab 5 Elite, which has the denoising engine built in. And it, it does tend to over sharpen in the default settings. So I, I try to back it off uh, a little bit, you know, most of the time I'm lazy. I just set it on auto and let it go. Well, I've been very happy with that myself. Uh, but like I said, that's that's why I like to. I wanted to show the Topaz and this other new one, Radiant, because these are not softwares I use personally. So, uh, but it's you know I don't want to feel like I'm only pushing one thing because there's a lot of things out there. So it's um, that's why I brought David in to show you those things. Okay. Um, the other thing is, um, <clears throat> last week I did some uh, aviation type photography. You know, I went to an air show and I did the typical air show type shots, right? Because when you go to a, an air show, particularly like the military ones here in the U.S., right, on the, on the air bases where you have the Blue Angels or you have the um, the Thunderbirds, they have their signature moves that they do and they name them all like echelons and and things i don't know it's very very technical i guess and you can get into it and personally i really like the images i captured from a technical standpoint because i i, I was able to capture the kind of images i wanted but when i when i researched a little bit to do some comparisons to other air shows uh photos i mean mine looked exactly the same and the only way you could tell the differences between the images that I took and say images that like a million other people take at these air shows is, um, you know, maybe just a little bit on the processing side, right? Uh, and, you know, weather, right? Because the air shows are typically held on, on sunny days, but it could be very cloudy. Uh, different times of the year, you got different lighting. So there's different there's there's some minor differences there, but you know, like I said, I was I was pretty happy with the images overall. Uh, being a first time out, being able to capture, and and I learned a lot about, um, you know, the, the the capabilities of the camera, and that and I I tend I tended to rely on it a bit too much, sort of like my bird photography, where you know suddenly with the OM one, you know, I can do bird tracking, airplane tracking shoot at 50 frames per second with full continual autofocus and then the amazing stabilization. And just like with post-processing, uh, the camera can do too much for you sometimes. And you stop thinking, right, about composition, uh, about maybe trying to tell a story or trying to capture an image that's unique to your voice and what you want to share about your experience of photographing different things and um uh so and and i got a lot of great feedback either through the comment section or through emails from many of you that have more experience uh shooting aviation so i really appreciate all of that and i went out and and i'm very lucky and unlucky in a way <laughs> that i have a lot of major airports right around me that i can go to and photograph just regular commercial type airlines and uh, Rick, who I think I saw was here, suggested I show you guys some of the other images that I took, if you haven't seen them already on my Flickr or Instagram. Uh, and every image that you take really, you know, it depends what you're trying to do, right? I'm a very technical photographer. I'm very gear orientated, right? I like to push the cameras to their limits, um, push the post-processing to its limits. Uh, it's mostly out of just academic curiosity. Like what is what, what are cameras doing for us now? 
that I couldn't do before? And how is it going to help me in my photography? Same thing with processing. What is processing doing now, post-processing, doing now that I could never do before? Like reducing noise has been, I think, one of the biggest improvements in post-processing that uh, I haven't seen in my entire time. I, I haven't been shooting that long, you know. But when I started with photography, noise reduction was very simply taking out chroma noise and speckles and then doing some artificial sharpening. But with all the AI processing going now, it's it's getting better. And it's, it's certainly, I think, for certain types of subjects, uh, you can certainly get much sharper images and much, much cleaner images. And I think it works well on general wildlife type photography, maybe some landscape. Uh, because these, these are things that are very random to the eye. And if you sharpen something like wildlife or nature, landscape type stuff, it doesn't look too unnatural, right? I mean, there's always a limit, of course, but you can kind of get away with a little bit extra processing without it looking too weird. Uh, but when it comes to very specific subjects, like uh, I was doing airplanes in this instance, or people's faces and portraits, this is where I think AI still has quite a ways to go, if any. Ultimately, I think you still need to spend most of your time getting it right in camera, getting exposure correct, you know, doing the best you can straight out of camera so that when you go into post-processing, the processing is very minimal. And that's just my, my personal opinion. You know, I don't want to take away from those that do spend a lot of time editing their images to get what they want and what they want to share with everyone. There's certainly uh, a lot of creative people that take it to extremes. Uh, and, you know, and that's, that's perfectly fine. Right. But for me, you know, I try to look at it uh, from, <clears throat> I'm trying to transition. I've been talking about this for the last few months. I'm trying to transition my photography from more of a technical type photographer where I'm looking at, um, you know, the rules of composition, for example. I'm looking at getting my lines straight and and trying to get the exposure correct. And I think from a technical standpoint, I'm at a phase of my photography where I can get just about any kind of image that I want, right? Like the air show is a good example. I've never been to an air show before, but, you know, my first time out, I was able to get the exact kind of images everybody else was taking without too much problem. I mean, yeah, it took me a lot of practice uh, <clears throat> while I was there, right? But I feel like I accomplished quite a bit very quickly. So, and I'm not trying to brag or anything, but I, you know, I'm fairly competent with a camera, right? I can, I can get the exposure I want. I can capture the images that I want. I can compose using you know, the general rules of composition. But where I'm struggling with and where I'd like to expand into is more into, uh, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Looking at photography as an art or the art of photography uh, as Ted Forbes' channel. So I've been watching a lot of Ted Forbes because uh, he talks about a lot of historical type or not only historical, but current photographers that are doing amazing work and just beautiful imagery that really doesn't really follow any rules. The exposure is not always perfect. The lines aren't straight. I mean, there is the kind of photography that is really amazing to me and that I'd like to expand into. And I'm starting to get a feel for that kind of photography, the kind that, that I want to expand into. So if you guys have been following me for the last four or five years, I forget how long I've been on uh you know that you know i'm relatively new overall i don't have the decades of experience that many of you'd have uh you you've come to my channel i guess to to learn the technical side like you know what button does this how do i get to this how do i get the camera to do this that or the other thing and and i try to simplify things the best i can and that's where i've always been but i'm very excited about this phase for me personally 
that I can I can um, start to go out and try to tell stories with my images and capture just just try to capture what I think would be you know I hate to use the word epic right but getting that epic photo and, and an epic photo to me is going to be very different than what an epic photo to someone else would be right um, this uh, I have a lot of students or other photo beginning photographers that come to me and say what do you think of this photo and my answer is usually very technical well the composition here would be better so that this has somewhere to go to and you know um, sometimes you like a little negative space you know I get into all of the technical things and I think these are these are fundamentals of photography that I think beginners should learn so that they can start to see things uh, in a way that uh, that they can express themselves better right and learn to break the rules quote unquote uh, so I, I think the foundations and fundamentals of photography are still solid and sound and everyone needs to know that you know about exposure aperture shutter speed priority right um iso and learning basic rules of composition and seeing these things and being able to identify these things in photography but looking at photos that are still epic and amazing that are breaking a lot of these rules whether it's the exposure or the composition so that's where i'm going i'm going and there's there's lots of great channels i mentioned the one art of photography uh ted forbes uh, a lot of his earlier videos were really good uh there's the uh the other guy the photographic guy i don't i don't know what his name is but his channel the photographic guy he he gives a lot of he's very articulate and uh focuses a lot on photography uh, so I recommend those two to check out. That's where I'm, I'm at right now. I'm more of a Ted Forbes guy <laughs> myself, but I'm looking at these kind of things. I'm also looking at uh, artwork and painting, uh, you know, Victorian painting where there's a lot of symbolism. I'm looking at a lot of things. So as, as I grow, these are areas that I want to grow into and I wanted to share with you. So I went out again after the air show last week i'll try and keep it short and i wanted to get your feedback and 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 on in two different ways right one is i wanted you to look at and i'm going to show a couple of the photos that i took from the air show which were very technical photos right capturing the certain maneuvers that they did uh going for the fine details and looking at the capabilities of the camera and my skill set of being able to capture very fast moving objects. It's a very, very technical images, in my opinion. Uh, versus, I went out again after getting feedback from, from Rick and many others uh, to try to be a little more creative and a little more thoughtful about the kind of photography that you do with aircraft. So I'm going to share those images. And I, I'd, like, I'd like to get your feedback in the chat section, you know, that you can share with me and others what you think about it because i know there's there was i got a lot of feedback from other aviation photographers um about the photography and and they're always very kind right but you can read between the lines sometimes right they can say a really nice thing about my image but if you kind of read between the lines they're like not bad but right that kind of thing but so feel free you know i'm always open to criticism i never get offended by any negative criticism or critiques uh, I look at it as a chance to grow and 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 learn something, right, from from all of you, because I've learned more from you guys uh, than I feel like I've been able to give to you in a lot of, in in terms of photography in general. Uh, so, unfortunately, I didn't I didn't prepare uh, <laughs> for this specifically. It was it was just kind of a spur of the moment thing uh, that I that I uh, thought I'd add on to the stream today. So I'm just going to go to um, I don't have my screens lined up right. Hold on. Give me one second. One of these days I'm going to prep for a stream so everything goes smoothly and I'm not just rambling for a half an hour. 
Okay, I'll drag this one over here. Maybe, maybe next week. <laughs> I say that every week, though. All right, there's that, but it's the wrong screen. That's interesting. Why isn't the screen coming up? Primary. Oh, no. All right, I should be back. Hold on. Let me try this one more time. Okay. Hopefully you guys can see and hear me now. Uh, let me just skim through the chat real quick. Oh, wow. Randy, Randy has a degree in photography. Interesting. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go through the chat after the stream's over. I do, I do watch every stream after the stream is over, and look at the chat. And I'm always, I'm always frustrated because I didn't get a chance to to respond or answer a lot of the questions you guys give. Uh, but I do look at them later. So if you do leave a comment, I don't answer your question or say anything, uh, feel confident that I do check it later. All right, so where's my Flickr? Let's go here. And so this, these, these are the typical air show type shots, right? The different formations, the different directions. This one here, this, ironically, this image here is very nostalgic for me because it reminds me of um, the old Godzilla movies where the air, the fighter jets come in and start shooting missiles at Godzilla or Ultraman. <laughs> so this image appeals to me in a way that it may not to a lot of people. But this is a very standard technical image that you'll find really from everyone that goes to an air show. And um, and and I showed this image before. I was like, you know, there's lots of great detail and uh, nice, clean formation. And it's really this is all has to do with the camera mostly and the lens I used and and just capturing the, the standard type air show type images. Uh, and I, I had a lot of fun. And photography to me is a lot about just having fun and enjoying and, and, and doing things that you've never done before. And this is something I've never done before. Uh, but again, what you're seeing are standard formation type images, uh, trying to get it as, as clean as possible in terms of noise and details. But there's nothing particularly that stands out in these images, right? I mean, this is kind of neat. Another standard formation type type image. But I went out to the local airport. Let me go down. Because if you do a search on the Thunderbirds aircraft at air shows, you could put my images, mix them in with everyone else, and it would look exactly the same. And I'm perfectly fine with that 
on a personal level because it's something I never done before. And being able to do that was was rewarding in and of itself for me. But uh, if you look at this image, this image here, um, I did sky replacement landscape. This is a totally processed composite image. But the image itself, even though it got a ton of likes, right? This is your typical Instagram type image, right? Where the colors pop, you have beautiful sky and some drama, but there's nothing real about this image because the actual image, you know, looked a lot like this one. It's just a picture of a plane, nothing particularly special about it. I mean, I love it personally for the details and look, because this is stuff I never done before and I really enjoyed it. Uh, but let's look at um, this, this. This is a good example of an image that does well on Instagram, but it's really over processed. But if we look at uh, this next image, I'm going to let you guys, I want you guys to comment on the images that I took of the Thunderbirds. Those were my comments. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say anything. I don't want to like, you know, put thoughts in the people's heads before they comment. But look at this image here. And if you can, go to go to Flickr and add comments there as well. I'd, I'd like to get your feedback on some of these and what you think of them in, in my aircraft album on my Flickr page. But uh, go ahead and leave some comments in the chat section for people that are here live now as well. And uh, I'll just let you look at th this one. Just I'll give it 30 seconds. I'm just reading your comments while while I'm going. I'm going back and reading these while you guys look at this one. Okay, so Plato and, and Randy say it tells more of a story, which I agree. Um and there's because it's more context, right? And Michael says, I like this one because it has a foreground and a background, not just a plane. And a, yeah, so there's some layering, right? Some technical reasons to like this image. Uh, I do a lot of square cropping uh, because of Instagram. <laughs> Plus, I like square crop crops in general, but yeah, I think different crops would definitely be better for some of these images. Um, but okay, so there's that. Let's um, let's look at another image here. Now, this image here, I did get some feedback that it's. Fairly ordinary image, right? But it's not very common. Like it's 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 hard to find these kinds of images where the plan is landing uh, in this way. I guess you know you can see the smoke from the tires when it hits the ground, and this is just a simple you know spray and pray, so to speak. This is probably this is probably a sequence of twenty images here. And one of my one of the things I did to help me get some of these images was I just completely ignored 
details and exposure to some extent. Uh, I didn't worry about fine details. I really wanted to try to capture the plane in its environment. And that was one of my main goals of, of this series of photographs. No, oh, Walter's here. How you doing, Walter? <laughs> Walter's the one that got me into Lightroom. <laughs> that when we were talking about this, he was a great help to me when I started photography back in 2013, I guess, is when I started. So not that long ago. It's it's long now because we're in 2022, but uh, it hasn't been a decade for me yet. But what, what do you guys think of this image? I'm just curious how you feel about this from a artistic standpoint, from a commercial standpoint. From a technical standpoint, you know, look at it from those three angles: the technical, ish, the technical image, artistically and commercially. Meaning, is this a sellable photo? Those are the three ways I guess you can look at an image. And this was this was practically the very next day or the second day that I went out to practice uh, after getting feedback from the first set of images that I took at the air show. Okay. For me, this image looks like, you know, this, this is your typical stock photography type image, right? Because there's lots of dead space where you can put text and print and things like that. But that's the only thing that comes to my mind for this image in a commercial way. Technically speaking, it's okay. The exposure is about right. It's not over-processed. This is pretty much straight out of camera. And uh, it's sharp enough. There's no fine, fine details, but it's sharp enough, right? Um, but there's a lot of distortion from the jet engines themselves, you know, throwing some heat out and stuff. Okay. Let's go to the next image. <clears throat> now this image I shot, this was at 40,000 ISO. It was pretty dark out at this point. And it's very heavily processed. There was so much noise in this image. So all of the details are gone. So from a technical standpoint, to me, this image is not very good. And I don't see much commercial value in this image either because the, the, the negative space is black. You know, there's just nothing. Obviously, you can put type and text in there, but if it's just black, it doesn't, it doesn't really add any value to the negative space from a commercial standpoint. From a artistic standpoint, I feel like the negative space kind of works here, but it's not, I don't know. I want to do this kind of image again. Um, because there, there are very small elements of this image that I like. Um, I like the, the landing lights hitting the runway. I don't know what, what the lights are here in the background. But it almost looks like there's flames in front. So we'll have to ignore that. That probably will never happen again. And I like the I like the speculars in the background. So there's 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 a couple of elements I like about this image, but overall, I think this image kind of fails uh, in a lot of ways on all three levels, technically, commercially, and artistically. It it to me it fails, but it definitely there's some very small things that I've picked up from this. So this is one of the things that you have to go out like every day or as often as you can and practice until you get the image that you, you start to identify the things. And when they all come together, you capture that image. This is something I can only take one or two things away from personally.
But just what do you guys think? Whoops, sorry. It just jumped up. Yeah, the lights give a nice, Druid was saying that the lights give a nice definition. Um, but really, you can't see the wings or anything. So I think if I were to do this again or try to capture this image, I'd like to see more of the wings, more of the engines. I mean, it just it was just not a very good capture. But like I said, there's some very small elements there that I think think could work in the future. Here's something I found on Wikipedia. Is an Alexa, stop. Novelty, so. Alexa. I can't say that name. Somehow it picks up sometimes. Okay, let's look at another image. Uh, Here's something I found on Wikipedia. Alexa, stop. Yeah, Walter's saying that the bridge lights and wings run together. Yeah, I, I'd like to be able to separate those a little better if I can, but I'd have to, I'd have to, I'll have to explore that space more and see what angles I can take the images from. Uh, now this image here, I had to crawl under a tree to get this image. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. I'll have to do a vlog at this location one time so you guys can see exactly the, the the environment that I'm in. And again, this image doesn't have much processing to it. It's pretty much straight out of camera. I may have just pumped the contrast a little bit. That's about it. And it's it's pretty much framed, 100. percent There's there's no cropping here either. Okay, Walter, we'll catch up with you later. Thanks for dropping in. I have seen that image, uh, Randy. That is That was a cool shot. I might try that just to try it. <laughs> it it'd just be one of those another how-to videos, right? But that was that, that was cool. Yeah, Plato thinks the mood is great. I think the mood is really, you know, uh, really good. It feels very peaceful, even though in reality it's so noisy there. But there's a little strip of, you can see a little strip down here of the water because <clears throat> this airport runs right along the Potomac River. And the lighting from the airports and the other planes uh, are just, they don't overwhelm. The image because a lot of times you know when you look at an image your eyes are drawn to the brightest thing in the frame and in this case the plane itself is not the brightest thing in the frame it's actually sort of the runway and the, a little bit of the airport but because it's kind of contrasted with this amazing sky the colors that i got really make the plane stand out and and the colors are very muted and very calming the, the the lavenders and the teals uh and in the context of the airport itself i don't know this this really i thought this one turned out really well from from almost every aspect technically it's very good the iso is a little bit high on it but technically it's a very good image in terms of composition and colors and lighting commercially i feel like it's pretty strong as well because there's there's good negative space for text and typing. 
And then from an artistic standpoint, I think it stands very well. It does have a very calming or uh, a very relaxing feel to it. So it's conveying an emotion of calmness or peace. So this image to me su succeeds on a lot of levels. And <clears throat> when I was out that day shooting, I was trying to just capture different things. I wasn't going specifically for everything that this image is working, how this image is working, but um, you know, just kind of going with my gut. Oh, this looks like a nice picture. I wasn't going out, but as I study these images and get feedback from all of you, you know, it helps me to focus more on what I think is making the image work and what I need to do the next time I go out when I go to capture these images so that when I go out, I only need to capture 20 or 30 images and I'm done rather than, I think I took like two or 300 images over a couple of hours uh, in this scene. A lot of that had to do with, you know, capturing the, the, the point that the plane hits the tarmac and you get the smoke from the tires. You know, I was going for those sort of typical shots, but I've only got a few of these and these turned out to be the best ones, I think. David thinks the foreground is distracting. Maybe a little. Yeah, it is a little bit busy on the bottom. Okay, let's go to another one. Where's... Go back to the album. Um, I'm going to show you my... Well, this is not bad. This one here. I'll leave you guys to comment and soak this one in and, and get your feedback on it. Then I'll tell you what I thought about it. Okay, um, <clears throat> this photo, I was very intentional on this photo in two ways. Uh, one is, obviously, I was trying to make the plane, and David noticed this. Uh, you know, I was trying to get the plane to look like it's, you know, like a football, right? Like it's gold. And it's off-center but that's because of the parallax error. So I was very intentional. I said, I could center this plane directly over the poles because it's flying at an angle, but then naturally it wouldn't look like it's going over the poles. It would be look off center. So to me, this looks like the plane is right over the goalposts because you have to account for that parallax error. So that's the technical side of me. The other thing is I was very intentional about capturing the kids playing underneath the goal. Now, I would have liked a little bit wider crop so that I would have captured more on the bottom, but I brought a 40 to 150 kit lens, right? So I couldn't make the, the angle any wider from where I was standing. Uh, so what I'm going to have to do next time is move further back and capture the image a little bit wider than I was able to capture here. And, and this is one of those things where I analyze these images and then when I go back, I can capture more what I wanted versus what I was able to do when I was in the field. 
because the light was changing very quickly at this point. And I was trying to do 20 different things, 20 different kinds of Im images, right? Or whatever. My mind was kind of scattered everywhere. But when I go out again, this is an image I'm definitely going to try and redo and do a better job with. But most of the elements are here. And I like the juxtaposition of the kids playing on the bottom versus this humongous aircraft flying over them, right? It's a huge difference in scale. Um, what might be interesting is maybe to get the, the people in the bottom to be about the same size as the plane. So either I need to make the plane smaller in the frame or try and get, get closer so that the people are larger in the frame. So I'm going to need to bring a wider angle lens because uh, I feel like the compression here is a little bit tight. Again, I'm getting technical, right? But from an artistic standpoint, uh, I, I really like this, this the kids playing in the bottom, this juxtaposition of that with this airliner going over the top. And then the goalposts just add another element to it. Uh, it's not the key element for me, but it adds another element. Like I think this picture would work just as well without the the, the goals in the frame. But the having the goals there just add just one more element or accent to the image that you're not going to find in a lot of places, right? Yeah, so what Druid is saying here. Uh, how about close, closer and lower? So it, he just he just basically said the same thing I did. I need to bring a wider angle lens so I can get closer to the people. And see how that looks. I don't know. I may not like it after I take it. But I'm trying to, like I said, I always try to analyze the photos when I'm, after I take them to see, see how it went. All right, uh, let's go to another one. I'm going to show you one more. Uh, this one. Again, this one is pretty much straight out of camera. There's a little bit of cropping here, so I, you know, I got all technical about it. But I'm going to leave this up for you guys to look at for 30 seconds. Leave some comments down what you think about this image, and then I'll tell you what I was thinking. Okay, so while the comments kind of roll in, I'll tell you what I was thinking, and then I want to read your comments. Um, <clears throat> clearly, I was going for the standard compositional technique of framing within a frame. But in this case, using the landing lights, there's a direct correlation between the frame and the subject, right? So I thought from a technical standpoint, this worked, and artistically it worked, right? From a creative standpoint, Framing, using a frame that's related to the subject, the frame the subject, I think really makes it very strong when you use this particular composition technique of frame within a frame. David pointed out, David Crooks pointed out the red graphic of the, I assume he means of the landing lights being red, juxtaposed against the bluish sky, because these are contradicting colors, right? So the contrast between the red and the blue or gray is very strong. And clearly, I was not going for sharpness or details on the plane itself. The plane itself is, you know, distorted a lot by the heat waves and everything. Um, but you can see the shape of the plane. You could probably even identify what kind of plane this is. Maybe it's a DC-10. I don't know. I don't know commercial aircraft at all. But 
I just love how it framed in there perfectly. And this took a few tries, but I did specifically go for this shot. And, uh, and, and I think that the image is balanced well, too. It doesn't feel, I mean, it may be a little bit, but it doesn't feel uneven or unbalanced. It just feels very, very good. Uh, because even though a lot of the weight of the image is on the left side, the verticals to me, you know, support it in a way that makes the rest of the image still feel balanced. So, again, I'm, I'm talking about it technically. From an artistic standpoint, I just I love it. I love the way this works. And this got the fewest likes on Instagram ever. <laughs> I think I got like 10 likes on this or something. Not that I care about those things because I share images a lot of times just, just to uh, show what I've been up to and stuff. But... Uh, so I was, I was going for a very simple compositional technique, a frame within a frame. But then when I analyze this, uh, I feel like that it has a lot more going for it. And uh, from from an artistic and technical standpoint, both of them are pretty strong. The, the commercial side or commercial aspect of it, I don't know. It doesn't have a lot of dead space for lettering and font. But I'm, I, I don't know what works commercially you know other than leaving dead space you know for text and type but maybe there's some other commercial value to this as well but this this i feel like was the my personal favorite of all the images that i took this is my personal favorite oh bob finley says he likes the uh the triangles yeah, I'm always a big fan of triangles, you know, and geometry, right? So, yeah, there's there's a lot of technical things here, right? There's frame within the frame, there's geometry, there's repeating patterns, there's a uh, nice contradictory uh, color palette, and it's a limited color palette, right? Red, green, and blue. There's not much else there. <laughs> uh, so th there's a lot of technical things. This, this image could probably work as a black and white, but... Uh, Technical points aside, I think this is a very unique image, and this is one of my personal favorites. And then I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to go through them all. Let me just go back. See if there was anything else here. You know, this this was okay. This is a typical shot. You know, nothing special here other than I gave the plane some room to fly and having the Washington Monument in the background. It kind of makes it unique in that sense. Uh, but for anybody that lives in this area, this is like a, you know, really boring image because everybody sees the Washington Monument and these planes every single day. All they did was put them together. So... Honestly, nothing to see here, but leave a comment, you know, either in Flickr or here in the chat section, what do you think of this image? I personally, it's not one of my favorites. Uh, by, by far, it's not even close. This image here, um, I'll give you 30 seconds. I do want to comment about this. What do you guys think of this one? Okay, so this, you know, this this is kind of middle of the road for me. Uh, 
but this this image here teaches me a lot about the location and what I, what I can capture when I go out again. And that's how I look at this image. This is a good shot for researching for going back again because there's a lot of things in this image that uh, a lot of information in this image that I didn't get in any other image that I took. So I don't look at this image as a particularly good shot um, for any of the reasons. I don't think it's very interesting or um, commercially viable or technically there's nothing special, right? Um, other than some balance. But from a scouting purposes, this is an image, you know, that you would take with an iPhone when you go out scouting. Something I need to do more of where I where I just go out and scout images. You know, I think someone mentioned that in the chat. But this shows me everything that is a possibility, right? Of course, the plane landing is nice, uh, but we have the tower here. You can see the entire, basically the entire airport itself, right? This is Reagan National where the planes park, all the little uh, ramps here for people to get on and off the plane, some of the crew and equipment down in here, uh, and then a little bit of landscape ahead of the airport. And then of course these, uh, whatever these things are, cranes or whatever they call these things. Uh, and the landscape of the sky itself, that the sun actually, the sun doesn't actually set here this time of year, but there's going to be a time of year when the sun is going to set right here or through these things if they're still there later in the year. Um, so I'm looking at this image. It's giving me so much information about this, this location. And I had to stand all the way to the far left, like underneath a tree. And, th and I had to hold the camera up over my head, over the fence. So I... I used the tilty screen to flip down so I could frame it. This was not an easy shot <laughs> as, you know, being there. I really need to bring a little stepping stool or something with me next time. So it was a difficult shot to take, but it gave me so much information about this, this site and, and the potential for more dramatic skies. Uh, like if there was a thunderstorm happening or a sunset where I have dramatic skies and I can get a starburst or whatever. You know, I can do a lot of things with this, this location. And that's why I like this shot. It's more for the information. And Lesipha says, I would have looked for an image that has the aircraft between the cranes and the tower. Yeah. Yeah, compositionally there, I like I said, I I didn't feel like this image really worked uh, in in a, in our in an artistic way or commercial way or or even technically. There's nothing difficult about this image, other than how I took it. I had to stand on a log and hold the camera up over a fence to get it. This this is as far left of the airport that I can get physically. Uh, I can't go any further to the left side, unless I go to the other side of the river. And then at that point, you know, the it's too far away. You'd need like a thousand millimeter lens and then there'd be heat distortion and everything else. But yeah, so this image to me was just an informational, good scouting image. And this, this caught my eye a little bit too. Uh, this will be the last image I show you. We'll give this, I'll give you guys 30 seconds to, to, to look at this and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Oh, Robert says, perhaps a lower shutter speed to show the motion of the plane. I like that idea on the last image. Definitely, because the, the, the airport itself is going to be sharp, but then you can get a little blur of the plane. I like that idea. Thanks. And Rick says, you got the aircraft fuselage nicely illuminated. Too often the aircraft and sky ruin the light balance. 
hate those cranes. Oh, you hate the cranes. What part of the story do they tell? Cranes are a distraction. Okay. Maybe they'll be gone later. <laughs> Lauren says it needs to be straightened, probably. What system that Chor was saying about uh, the plane banking, getting more dramatic sky, a flock of birds would be nice. That's <laughs> getting the plane banking is would be next to impossible from this vantage point that I showed earlier. But um, the flock of birds right now, that's actually not that uncommon over there. I saw lots of flocks of birds. But it was so random that I couldn't concentrate on doing that kind of shot. Getting the kind of shot that System Mature is talking about, it would require going every day for a couple hours a day, waiting for that perfect moment or decisive moment where all, all those things come together. So it's not impossible, but it definitely takes, it takes a lot of commitment and time. So, okay, so I like this image. Uh, again, limited color palette, just red, blues, and, and, and whites. It's a little bit warm with this. Um, but I like how the tail fins at the bottom came together and sort of offset the red of the uh, Coast Guard helicopter. So it's not a great image, but I do like sort of the color balance between the red fins on the planes and the redness of the chopper. Um, so there's there's something here that works for me and I can't quite put my finger on it, but I'm guessing it's it's that that balance of that touch of red at the bottom and the touch of red in the left. Because um, technically the image is really a train wreck. Uh, it's a little bit crooked. The, the angle of view is off. The lighting's not bad, but then, you know, the sky's not very dramatic. You know, there's a lot of things about this image that are not good, but there is something about it that that just I I, I wanted to try again and do again and try and get get that get something more creative with this particular image. But what what do you guys think? I. I like this image for very small things. It's a bit over processed too, uh, from from a sharpening and denoising standpoint. But so some of some of the colors and details are smudged. But I, I don't care about that. I'm more worried about the composition and the. I guess there's a lot of geometry here. Maybe that's what I like about it because I'm an architectural guy, right, by trade. But I, I also like how the antennas, as I'm looking at this, are all pointing up at the helicopter. That's kind of cool. But, yeah, it's mainly these two wings down here and this plane. These, these two colors just work together for me. But, okay, we'll end it there. And Rick says, yes, Rob, you do have to go every day, day after day, once you know what shot you're after. As with all photography, it's about identifying possibilities and then being there at the right moment. Yes, definitely. That is something I've learned over time, but I've not put the time in <laughs> to do that. And it's something I definitely want to make time to do so that when I go out and I take that one image, you know, um, or I go to a specific location, I have maybe five or six shots in mind that I want to take. And, uh, whoops. Yeah, so I, I have five or six shots that I want to take. Maybe, maybe one picture, you know, that I want to take. And I'm going to go consistently at the right time of day and the right spot and wait for that right moment to capture that image. Uh, it's something that, 
you know, you learn over time that that's the only way to get the shot sometimes. But do you take the time to do it, right? And this is a location that is relatively convenient for me. It's only 10 miles from my house, right? It's very close. But depending on the time of day, it's like an hour drive. It took me almost an hour to get to this spot. And it's only 10 miles from my house. Ugh. Because I went, I went in the morning during rush hour. Big mistake. But that's when the light is really good. So I actually I have to leave my house like two hours before the light is perfect. So that it doesn't take me an hour to get there. Ugh. It's really frustrating, the traffic in this area. And then it takes me an hour to get home, depending on the time of day. From, from a spot that, you know, I almost think that taking my bicycle would be faster during rush hour. But basically, it, it takes this particular location, though, depending on, you know, the time of year, you know, it's going to offset where the sun is. So I need to, I need to get that app photo pills that will help me time the sunset, sunrise, also look at the weather, then, you know, planning, right? Planning is, I, I'm starting to realize, is probably the one of the most important things, if not the most important thing to getting that epic or, or amazing image is a lot of planning goes into a lot of these images and I'm not just going to go out and get an amazing shot. I have to plan the shots. And looking at these images and, and getting a lot of advice from you guys, I'm, I'm starting to realize that more and more, that you can't just rely on just blind luck. You know, Of course, there's always going to be those lucky shots, right? Like, wow, that was lucky. You got that amazing shot. But this particular location is giving me an opportunity to take a really amazing shot if I plan it correctly. And that's that's why I'm excited about this shot, even though it's a pain in the butt to get to at certain times of the day. Um, you know, being a major airport, there's a lot of traffic there anyway. But being in this area right in D.C. is a big problem. But it's not, it's not unsurmountable, right? It's something I can definitely do. And there's still enough nice weather days to go out. I did have a couple of issues. Um, with people there. Um, generally, it's it's not a problem. I mean, I've been there three times this week. And uh, I had some random guy just cussing at me for nothing. Nothing. I'm standing there taking pictures and the guy just starts cussing at me. I, I would, <laughs> all I, you know, because I'm walking around the field, right? And, uh, and I'll, I'll turn my I'll turn back to make sure I don't walk back into somebody. So I turn back and this guy's probably 20, 30 feet away or about 20 feet away from me. But he's just cussing at me, calling me names and, and things I can't repeat online. Uh, some lunatic. And then another time some lady was yelling at me uh, for something. So th there's some there's some f freaky people out there for, for you know. I'm not talking to nobody. I'm not doing nothing. I'm just standing there taking pictures like a few other people are. Uh, and I've had two different people come up to me and just, just start giving me the business over nothing. Just, just started calling me names that you would not believe. People would call me for no reason. For no reason. I can't, I can't figure it out. So, but... On the flip side, I did meet somebody else really nice there. Uh, he was actually from the UK, but he's lived in this country for 30 years. And he was there visiting. Um, he actually runs a tour bus and he was bringing tours to the area. Uh, it's, it's kind of ironic that, that a UK person is working in the tourist business in the US, showing people where to go in the US. Uh, that that contradiction, I, I forget its name. He's a really nice guy, though. Um, so you have to take the good with the bad, right? <laughs> but okay, uh, I think I'll wrap it up here. Um, yeah, mental problem is a real problem. Yeah, it's crazy. And then Rick says, can you give Druid your email address? Oh, 
Yeah, my email address. I'll just type it in here. If you guys want to email me, it's there, rob at robtrek.com. Um, it's pretty easy to remember, right? <laughs> um, just email me there, and I try to reply. I haven't gotten anything from, uh, well, that's not true. He did send me something a week ago. But I get emails from you guys all the time, from many of you. And I, I try to read and respond to all of them. Uh, I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy I enjoy communicating with you at, on when you can't be in the stream, you know, through email or through the comments section, on my f comments in the Flickr or on my forum. I did revamp my forum because, you know, the traffic on that died completely. Uh, and I, I revamped it so it's a little bit simpler now. So check out my robtrek.com slash forum. Uh, that's another way to to uh, to reach out to the community, not just me, but to everyone else that's in our in our community here. So uh, with that said, thanks everybody for coming in today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the feedback. You know, if you if you get a chance, go to the Flickr page uh, and leave comments on the individual images. You know, critique them as hard as you want. You know, or, or or compliment them. Either way, the things that you like. But I'm looking for things that maybe you liked about it, what you didn't like about it. Um, so give me some context of um, what I can do next time I go out. But every time I go out there, I learn something new. I sit down and I analyze all my images. And I thought I'd just share that with you today. Uh, the stark difference between doing the air show type photos where I was going for a very technical image, classic, you know, maneuvers, classic details, going for fine details, showing the capabilities of the camera versus I just went out with the 75 to 300 and 40 to 150 kit lenses and said, let me just try and capture some images where I'm going to be forced not to use some of the capabilities of the camera, right? 50 frames per second. I can't do that with those lenses. Those lenses aren't particularly sharp, so I'm not going to try and get fine details, right? So I did I did try to minimize my technical capabilities with the gear when I went out to shoot. Uh, I didn't want to just go out there with an iPhone, right? Because eventually I will want to get a good image <laughs> with a good camera. So, uh, But anyway, that that's it I had for today. Again, I really appreciate your time and spending with me. I want to thank David Crooks again for sharing his uh, experience with his uh, software products, Topaz and uh, Radiant. I recommend you check those out for yourself. But um, till next time, thanks for being here, and we'll see you again soon.